All right. Hello, Nashville. We're going to talk about making script great again. My name is Brandon Black. I'm at Swan. I work on Bitcoin self-custody stuff, and I want to make that better. So we're going to talk about how covenants can help do that, I think, and lots of other stuff, too. Here's the contents. First, I want to start with getting the basics right. So we'll talk about just how Bitcoin script works. We're going to talk about covenants and lightning. We all love the lightning network. We're going to make that better. We're going to talk about freedom. Bitcoin's about freedom. And covenants increase your freedom to use Bitcoin the way you want to. And we're going to talk about improving the overall Bitcoin user experience through covenants and covenant layer twos and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I support better script for all because I'm a Bitcoin communist. So first, I have a question for everyone out there. Do you use script to lock your Bitcoin? Raise your hand if you use script to lock your Bitcoin. Anybody? Anybody? You all do. If you have Bitcoin, you use script to lock it. There's no other way to do it. When you receive Bitcoin, you make a locking script. You may not know this because your wallet does it for you, but you make a locking script. You make an address. You give the address to a sender. The sender's wallet deconstructs the address back into a locking script. They send some Bitcoin to that script, and it's locked until that script is satisfied. That's how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin in the Lightning Network works that way. Bitcoin in wrapped Bitcoin at BitGo works that way. Bitcoin, any Bitcoin everywhere, it's all locked by a locking script. So everybody, including the ETFs, everyone uses script to lock their Bitcoin. Here's how that looks a little bit, because I want to get the groundwork laid here before we get into some other covenant stuff. If you have a single signature, paid a pub key, the original kind of Bitcoin address, well, after paid IP, whatever. Um, it's a public key and an op check sig. If you have a multi sig, it's three public keys with, a, with some numbers around it and a, multi, a check multi sig. Um, time locks look like that. And then Lightning HTLCs are just another script with more op codes, including those time lock covenants from the time lock. So everything we do, all of Bitcoin, is all based on scripts. You may not know this. We're talking about covenants, covenant proposals. Covenants are already in Bitcoin. Covenants enabled the Lightning Network. Those two covenants were called check lock, lock time verify and check sequence verify. And respectively, they're used to sequence the updates to Lightning channels and to delay settlement of Lightning channels for penalty purposes. Without covenants, we would not have the Lightning Network as it is today. We've got those. More covenants will enable more Lightning. There's lots more we can do with the Lightning Network. For example, if we had check template verify or TX hash or cat plus check sig from stack, we would get lightning symmetry, otherwise known as L2. This is a way of making lightning channels easier to maintain. You don't need to have new channel backups every time there's an update to the channel in order to recover your channel safely. Even an old backup, the worst that can happen is that you close to the latest corrected state with an L2 channel. And that's, I think, a, a big benefit to people that might run nodes on a home server or something, not having to, to really worry about how up-to-date your backups are. Also, these same pairs of opcodes would enable point-time-locked contracts with simplified scripts. Again, everything we do in Bitcoin is based on script. So the, if we add these covenants, we can make simpler scripts to accomplish what we want to do with the Lightning Network. And point-time-locked contracts are great. This is not a talk about those, but one of the things they do is they improve the privacy of using Lightning. And privacy is a big part of freedom. So Bitcoin, covenants, more freedom, better Bitcoin. Should we do these? Should we get better Lightning channels and more freedom in, in our Bitcoin through privacy? You tell me. Even more Lightning. We have more covenants. There's even more we can do with the Lightning Network. One of the great challenges right now with the Lightning Network is the onboarding experience. You have to have a channel to receive Lightning. There's a couple proposals out there, Arc and Timeout Trees most notably, that would let users join the Lightning Network without first having a pre-existing channel. And these covenants that I list here would enable that. There's also a concept out there called cold channels, where you can have a kind of a, a Lightning channel in potentia in a cold wallet that when you reveal it to the channel partner, it becomes a lightning channel. So now you can have your cold storage and eat it too. And I think that would be pretty cool. 
Also, simplified channel factories. Right now, you can make a Lightning Channel factory, but it's, a, it's an interactive protocol to get to a, a channel factory where you can onboard many users to Lightning with a single transaction. Um, but we can make that simpler with covenants. And, and there's more. So more covenants, even more Lightning. Now we get into some of the other direct freedoms. For those of us who are lucky enough to be this early in Bitcoin, we have probably some on-chain Bitcoin. And I think we should also have more freedom in how we use our on-chain Bitcoin. It's not just about Lightning. Lightning's great, but it's not only about Lightning. So if we were to have a covenant like Obvault, instead of having only the time locks we have today that apply from the time a UTXO is created, with Obvault, you can apply a time delay when the Bitcoin starts to be spent. In the panel I was on earlier, a Andrew, I think, talked about that, and Tyler as well. Um, the point here is that it's reactive security. You can lose your seed, observe on chain that someone has your seed and is trying to move your funds, and then sweep them somewhere safe as they're trying to move. And what an important thing about this, we wouldn't expect users to actually have to do this, this sweep action, very often. But if you think about the $5 wrench attack, if you make it public that your funds are held in a vault, no one's going to bother $5 wrenching you because they're going to know they still don't get the funds. They're just going to get swept to your cold storage. So this is part of making it safe and free to use Bitcoin. Check template verify. This is a, kind of the, one of the simpler covenant proposals that's out there. Is basically all it can do is specify that when the next time this Bitcoin is spent through this script path, it's all scripts, specific outputs have to be created in that spending. Now, what does that do? Well, that might mean that you can say, if I don't spend these Bitcoin within the next 10 years, a time lock is satisfied, and then with no keys, they can be sent to Coinbase, let's say, and Coinbase has my, has my will, and they'll distribute the funds to my heirs. You can have delays that then specify the destination after the delay. That kind of thing you can do with Check Template Verify, along with all that lightning stuff I mentioned earlier. And then TX hash, TX hash is like the general version of Check Template Verify. You can restrict anything you want about the transaction. What inputs are going to go into it? In the BitVM panel, they talked about how the benefits for BitVM, if you can restrict the inputs to a transaction to specific values, TX hash is the, the thing for that. You can specify any little piece of your Bitcoin transaction and say, the next time this Bitcoin is spent, that piece has to be in that way. And this lets you do all kinds of cool stuff, amount restrictions, velocity restrictions, with some nuances we're not going to get into here, but it can be very significant increase in the freedom of how you lock your Bitcoin. All right, why are we talking about all of this? I mentioned it earlier, but I want to really like put it up on the screen here. Sending and receiving Bitcoin is a mixed bag today. When I want to send some Bitcoin on chain, I have to go to my node and mempool space and maybe a few other places, see what the fees are like. I have to pick a fee rate to send that Bitcoin. It might take an hour or two hours sometimes to confirm, especially if I'm cheap, which I am. Uh, the block times are unpredictable. I have to decide how much of my Bitcoin's in a hot wallet versus a cold wallet. Uh, it's, just, it's a pain. Sending Bitcoin on chain can be a pain. On the other hand, if I've got a lightning wallet and I want to send some Bitcoin, I just send the Bitcoin. And the only problem is that my keys are hot to do that. On the flip side, for receiving Bitcoin on chain, super easy. I make that locking script you talked about and give, it, give the address to someone. They send me Bitcoin. The only thing I'm dealing with is that it might take a little while to confirm. But generally, receiving on chain is a great experience. Receiving on Lightning is maybe not so great. I want to receive $100 on Lightning. Well, OK, I've got capacity for that. I want to receive $200 on Lightning. I can't because my Lightning channel only has $110 of inbound capacity. Um, you also have hotkeys. And if I want to you know, onboard my friend or my taxi driver, my single serving friend, whoever it is, they have to get a channel first. So I can't just like get an address from them and send them some Bitcoin on Lightning. They have to set up. And the setup can be costly and time consuming. So we have this kind of annoying split here in the user experience of Bitcoin between sending and receiving on chain versus Lightning. And I, I think we can make that better in the future. Everyone and their house opcat wants to make that better in the future. Here's just a small list of the many, many proposals out there that are trying to make this experience of using your Bitcoin, sending, receiving, holding, more predictable, simpler, better for everyone. 
not everyone can do it today. The ones in white here can be done with Bitcoin as it is today, we think. We've seen some talks on this stage earlier about some of the ways to do those things. But the ones in orange don't work today. They need covenants. They need more covenants to happen. And they're the only ones of the things that have been talked about for scaling Bitcoin that maintain this unilateral exit property that is so important to Lightning. The reason that we can say that holding Bitcoin in a Lightning channel is really holding real Bitcoin is because even if your channel partner disappears, even if they're malicious, your Bitcoin is safe and you can unilaterally claim your Bitcoin. And only the proposals up here that require additional covenants maintain that property that they have unilateral exit. So I think there's, a, I think there's almost a necessary correlation here that to maintain that property of unilateral exit in the past, we've had to add covenants to Bitcoin and the time lock covenants we have. And in the future, we will add additional covenants to Bitcoin to maintain that property of unilateral exit as we scale Bitcoin with additional, feature, additional mechanisms. Whether they're going to be cat VM or arc or timeout trees or some other thing, I'm fairly confident that whatever they're going to be, they're going to require additional covenants in Bitcoin script for that to happen. So here's my thoughts. Lightning uses covenants. Lightning made using Bitcoin better, right? Many of us remember being in Bitcoin, trying to send on-chain transactions during some of the earlier, we think they were kind of spam attacks that were happening around the fork wars. And having Lightning really made that experience much better. You can predictably spend your Bitcoin if you've got Lightning channels open, very low fees, very quick, very easy. And that used covenants to get us there. We're going to keep improving the Lightning network by adding additional covenants to Bitcoin. And the overall experience of Bitcoin, from the Lightning Network to on-chain, to custodians, to cold storage, hot storage, all of that is going to get better through the addition of additional covenants to the Bitcoin protocol. The ways that people are talking about improving Bitcoin without additional covenants compromise on the self-sovereignty that is so important to all of us. And I already said this. So additional covenants improve the user experience for everyone in sending, receiving, and holding Bitcoin. And we're going to make script great again, or maybe for the first time. You can reach me on X and on email. I'm out there. That's about all I got. If you have any questions, you can shout them out. Shout it up. Oh, what are the drawbacks to adding covenants? I'm so glad you asked, because I did not talk about drawbacks here. The main drawback to adding anything to the Bitcoin protocol is that it adds complexity fundamentally. Bitcoin is an open source project that is maintained by hundreds of people around the world. The code is running on thousands of nodes. And there is, of course, a maintenance cost to any code we add to Bitcoin. So definitely, as, as part of adding covenants, it's very important that we, these things are done in thoughtful ways that that progress the protocol safely forward without adding undue complexity. The other thing that is often talked about as a downside or a risk of adding covenants is the risk of making Bitcoin script too expressive. And this is something that, that I've gone through a journey on in the last year or so that I've been focusing and, and looking at this stuff, thinking about how to make script great again through covenants. And at first, I was very much in the, OK, we don't want to go too far with covenants. If we add too many covenants or too much, too much feature functionality, too much freedom to Bitcoin, then that's going to have a cost. That's going to have a, a trade-off that people are going to use Bitcoin in, in ways that are going to harm the network. We're going to have, a, uh, whether, whether it's a spam attack or whether it's going to be uh, MEV or centralizing MEV, there's going to be a problem if we add too much expressivity. As I've gone down this journey, I've, I've really come to realize, and I, and I kind of showed it with the, the slide about how the proposals that use covenants or additional covenants, um, have the, they maintain the self-sovereignty of Bitcoin. And the ones that don't, they make sacrifices. Adding covenants to Bitcoin is all about harm reduction. People are going to try and build things on Bitcoin in the form of, of BitVM or ZK rollups using massive scripts or ZK proof verifiers. Whatever they're going to do, they're going to do that no matter what we do with the protocol. By adding sufficient functionality to the protocol, we can make it so that those things are more compact on chain. 
so they have less downside in terms of spamming the chain. We can make it so that those things are safer, so they have less risk in terms of any kind of a systemic risk where protocols could blow up and damage the kind of overall Bitcoin ecosystem and all that kind of stuff. So I, I have to acknowledge the idea, because it's the journey I went on, that adding covenants could have risks to Bitcoin in terms of the overexpressive, the problems you see in Ethereum, but also I think we need to be very aware that we're reducing the risk, many other risks, by adding covenants. So I hope that answers your question, and thank you. Any other, any other questions out there? Another one. Right, well, well some of these proposals take up more block space. Um, in general, what covenants end up doing is, is allowing you to compress how much block space you're going to need to do the same thing. And, and that's because Bitcoin can already do a lot of this stuff just very inefficiently. And so what you're really doing with a new covenant type opcode is compressing a concept that can be expressed through a prover verifier, BitVM, or some other structure into a, a small opcode. Uh, so the result is that you get the same result with less block space. Now, of course, there's always the problem that we see, I, I forget the name of the paradox, but you build a bigger road than more people use the roads. So I think that adding covenants will increase usage of Bitcoin because they compress the amount of space it takes to do any particular thing. And that will mean that the overall block space gets more crowded, but it gets more crowded uh, sublinearly. You get more stuff to happen on Bitcoin than the amount of space it takes up. So it, it's a trade-off, of course. We are gonna see busy block space, but I hope everyone out there knows that if Bitcoin block space isn't busy in the future, then Bitcoin will die because we either have to add inflation to pay miners or we have to have full blocks. So we actually want Bitcoin block space to be full, but we want it to be full in efficient ways. And, and covenants are a way to keep blocks full efficiently. All right, I'm gonna call it a wrap. Thank you all very much.